Okay, I guess we're ready to go. And um, I'd like to uh, look at a, a book with you that's tucked into the last part of the Old Testament and blow the dust off a little prophecy that has a big message. It's the book of Habakkuk. If you can find it, it's somewhere in the back at the end of the Old Testament there. And uh, uh, a book of three chapters. And um, we're going to be looking at it in the coming weeks, Lord willing. And tonight I'd like to kind of do a, a bird's eye view, uh, an overview of, of the book, sort of touching down on some of the key points. And um, so let's go to Habakkuk chapter one. I don't know how many of you are struggling to come to terms with the craziness in our world, but all sorts of strange things go on. If a teacher refers to his students as boys and girls, he can now lose his job. And if a parent opposes the decision of a child to change his gender, he can end up in jail. If you use the wrong pronoun in addressing someone, you've broken the law and uh, you could be in trouble. And if you thought there were only two genders, well, think again. Now we're told there are more than 100. So, And it just goes on, doesn't it? And just when you th thought the world couldn't get any crazier, it does. It seems that we're living at a time when everything that we thought was right and decent and normal is getting questioned. It seems that we are witnessing the demolition of Western society and the walls are getting pulled down one brick at a time. There's this Old Testament book that's very relevant uh, for a time like this. And uh, I'd like to look at it with you tonight. Um, this book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a Hebrew prophet, probably a, a contemporary of Jeremiah. He prophesied sometime before the, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And that's around 600 years before Christ. And Habakkuk's book is unlike those of other minor prophets who came and declared, thus says, says the Lord, Habakkuk's book is not a message from God. It's a dialogue with God. A wrestling maybe would be a better term uh, because there are some very troubling things that are going on in Habakkuk's world. And he takes his complaints and his concerns to God. He pours out his frustration to the Lord. And frankly, it might it sounds like something we might like to say to God as well. 600 years before Christ sounds very much like the 21st century. The issues that Habakkuk brings up are rather prevalent today. So look what he says in verse one of his prophecy. Just a minute here. Um, I'll be right with you. Sorry about that. I had a Bible beside me, but um, it's a Bible in Spanish, and you may not understand too much of that. <laughs> I was just sharing with, uh, before coming on this Zoom meeting, I was sharing with a, a group of national workers in Peru. Uh, they were having a, an event for two nights, and uh, tonight was the second night. Fortunately, because of the time difference, there was no conflict with the schedule. Okay, now I've got an English version, so let's take it in English. <laughs> the burden which Habak the prophet Habakkuk saw, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. God, I've been praying about this for a long time, and, and you're not answering. There are nasty situations going on, and you're not doing anything about it. Verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Um, therefore, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Lord, why is there so much violence and social unrest? Why is there a breakdown of law and order? Corruption abounds and evildoers are getting a free ride. And Habakkuk looks around and things are going from bad to real bad. And the rich are getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. Debauchery and depravity were becoming commonplace. 
evil is running rampant lord things are a mess i'm praying i'm calling out to you and you're not doing anything about it so this man has some questions for god god where are you why is this happening how, how long can this go on now taking your complaints to god is actually a very biblical practice it's something the psalmists did frequently in the book of the psalms there are four main genres of psalms there are the psalms of thanksgiving there are hymns there are wisdom psalms and there's a fourth genre psalms of lament and that's when the psalmist is in a dark place he can't see his way forward he complains about the prosperity of the wicked he cries because his enemies are stomping all over him and he brings his pain and frustration to the lord there's quite a few psalms like that lord how long will you hide your face from me lord why are you allowing this to happen and the psalmists were very honest in their in voicing their grief or their sorrow at times they even seem irreverent but psalms of lament are in the bible because there are moments in life when it's appropriate to pour out your heart to god and we learn from the psalmist that we don't have to hide our pain or frustration or doubts from god and here we have a lament from the prophet habakkuk we have his lament in verses one to four and then in verses five to eleven we have god's response verse five look among the nations and watch be utterly astounded for i will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you and the dialogue between habakkuk and god goes more or less like this the prophet says god things are in a horrible mess you are not hearing my prayer why don't you do something and god answers as a matter of fact habakkuk i am doing something but if i told you what i was doing you wouldn't believe me you wouldn't believe me and the prophet says lord to tell me what you're doing and i'll believe you and the lord says well here's my plan and he explains to the prophet what he's doing and habakkuk's response is god i don't believe you and he's flabbergasted at god's response really god you cannot be serious you cannot be doing what i hear you to be saying you're doing and the prophet has two complaints one god why don't you do something and two god how in the world could you be doing what you're doing verse six god says for indeed i am raising up the chaldeans a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs chaldeans is another name for the babylonians uh, babylon was emerging on the world stage as a dominant power they had crushed the assyrian empire they had defeated egypt a new empire was rising up and now the lord says habakkuk what i'm doing is this i am raising up the babylonians and they're going to come and bring judgment on jerusalem and in verses 7 to 11 god describes the military might of babylon they are like wild savage beasts they are swift and ruthless and cruel they plunder mercilessly they trample everything in their path and so god is saying i'm stirring up an angry superpower that is going to come and overrun you and habakkuk can't believe what he's hearing this is not the kind of comfort the prophet was looking for god you are raising up the babylonians against us the babylonians are pagans they're wicked and cruel they're a nasty piece of work are you planning to use them to judge us and habakkuk can't get his head around this and he voices his concern about god's plan look at verse 13 you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look wickedness and cannot look on wickedness why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours one more righteous than he 
Lord, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look favorably on wickedness. So why would you use a wicked and treacherous people to accomplish your purposes? Lord, this does not seem right. One of the things that we learn about God's ways in the Old Testament is that when one nation falls into extreme depravity, God often raises up another nation to bring judgment on them. You will remember that at the Tower of Babel, people planned to unite and build a tower that would reach up to heaven. They wanted to make a great name for themselves and God said, no, we're not gonna do that. And he confounded everyone's language with the result that the tower project was abandoned and people migrated in every direction with others who spoke their language. Consequently, the world has divided into thousands of cultures and languages and people groups. And down through history, when one nation goes into moral decline and falls into abominable practices, God uses another nation to bring judgment on them. For instance, when when the Canaanites fell into extreme depravity, God set out to deal with them. And you remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 15. He said, Abraham, your descendants are going to go down to Egypt for a long time. But in the fourth generation, they will return. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Take notice of that phrase in verse 16. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Israel will come back and they will conquer and they will destroy the Amorites, but not yet. Not yet for the iniquity of these people is not yet complete. And God is saying the iniquity of the Amorites is going to get to a point where we will have to put a stop to it. It's going to get so bad that the land will vomit out its inhabitants. So when Joshua finally invaded and put the, the inhabitants of Canaan to the sword, it wasn't because they had been there long enough and now it was somebody else's turn. No, God was bringing judgment upon the depraved inhabitants of the land and the debauchery and evil of the Canaanites could not continue. And Israel became the instrument of divine judgment. And then Israel was warned, make sure you don't fall into the sins practiced by the Canaanites. Because if you do, you too will be judged and destroyed. And the day finally came when the prophets said to the people of Israel, your sins are worse than the ones practiced by those who lived here before you. Israel fell into the same abominations. And what happened as a result? Assyria rose up and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And then Judah went into more moral decline. And now God is saying to Habakkuk, Babylon is going to come. Babylon is coming and will bring judgment on the southern kingdom there are three sins in particular that spell the end of a civilization human sacrifices like those done in our hospitals nowadays by abortion human sacrifices moral perversion and demonic practices when those sins become widely practiced, we've come to the final chapter. In the 1500s, Francisco Pizarro invades South America with 180 men, and he overthrew the mighty Inca Empire, one of the great civilizations of history. How could 180 men do that? You have to believe that God pulled the plug on them. This was not just a military conquest. This was the judgment of God upon a depraved 
degenerate society. And uh, you will discover that human sacrifices had become very widespread in the Americas, at least in Central and South America, maybe in the North too, I'm not sure. But are we now seeing God's judgment on the Western world? Is God saying, you don't want God? Okay, let's see how that works out for you. And everything starts to unravel and society begins to come apart at the seams. Is this what happens to nations when God gives them over to their bad choices? Is this what happens when people turn away from God? According to Romans 1, the final stage is when God gives people up to a depraved mind, a reprobate mind. That seems to be what is happening in our world. Nothing makes sense anymore. We don't know what up is or what down is. We don't know what marriage is. We don't know what a woman or a man is. We don't know what is right and what is wrong. We've lost our way and all the lines have become fuzzy. A depraved mind, blinded to the truth. So how do we come to terms with that? What do we do when God allows evil to come in like a flood? Well, Habakkuk is trying to come to terms with wickedness going rampant and with God using a wicked nation to accomplish his purposes. And it's all rather hard for him to understand. Chapter two, verse one, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And God has some advice for the prophet. He says, be quiet and listen. I have some things to say to you. Pay attention. Write this down. Because that way, other people can read it and get helped as well. So Habakkuk wrote it down. And that's why we're reading his book right now. God said to him, you're going to have to wait a while. Trust me. In time, the evil of the Babylonians will double back on them. Their day is coming. And in this chapter two, God pronounces five woes upon the Babylonians. He does not overlook their sins. And the moment will come when the destroyers will be destroyed. God is going to deal with them. God has another word, and it's in the fourth verse. And this verse is the key to the whole book. As a matter of fact, it's the key to all of life. The verse is quoted three times in the New Testament, in Romans 1, Galatians 3, and Hebrews 10. Habakkuk 2, 4, behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. We could put it like this. The one who is righteous by faith shall live. And this is the verse that kicked off the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. It was the discovery that we are not saved by our efforts, not saved by our performance. We're saved by faith. Righteousness or rightness with God comes not by working at it. It comes by faith in Christ. It's a gift, a marvelous, undeserved gift for those who put their faith in Christ. This is a, a wonderful truth, but what Habakkuk is emphasizing in this chapter is not being saved by faith, but living by faith. We need faith not only to find peace with God, we need faith to live in the enjoyment of peace with God. We need faith in God when the Chaldeans are at the gates and when the Babylonians are coming over the walls. We need faith to start our life with God, and we need faith to keep walking with God. 
the Christian life is a life of faith. It is trusting God when life is coming apart. Faith is refusing to panic, says Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's learning to lean on him when everything else is collapsing. That's what Habakkuk is talking about. Verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. This verse um, shows up five times in the Old Testament. <laughs> what a promise. What a great promise we have here. Evil will not always have the upper hand. God is going to write the last chapter, and it will be glorious, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How much of the sea is covered by water? Well, there's not one square inch of the sea that is not covered by water, right? This world where evil so often prevails is going to be inundated, flooded with the knowledge of the glory of God. That's where our story ends, and we can be sure of it. This verse gets repeated five times in the Old Testament. This is a story with a wonderful, glorious ending. And then, then we come to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is very much like Psalm 18. Here the prophet has a remarkable vision. And in the vision, God shows up in blazing in his splendor and he unleashes his fury against the wicked. He shakes the earth and the mountains tremble. The nations quake with fear. The sun and the moon stop in their tracks. He scatters his enemies and the wicked are brought to justice. Devastation and destruction comes upon them and God works powerfully to deliver his people. Chapter 3, verse 12, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. It's an awe-inspiring vision. It, it is such a frightening display of power that the prophet is left shaking in his boots. Verse 16, when I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in myself. The vision made a huge impact on the prophet and his heart pounded, his lips quivered, his legs trembled, it rocked his boat. The power and the greatness of God shook him up and filled him with fear. The lesson for the prophet was very clear. God is very, very powerful. He is indescribably great. He does what he wants, where he wants, and when he wants, and no one can stand in his way. It's easy to get intimidated as we see what's going on around us. We can be easily overtaken by fear. But notice what happens to Habakkuk. God directs his attention away from the greatness of his problems to the greatness of his God. The prophet had been focusing on everything that was going wrong, everything that was going on around him, but here he begins or he regains an upward focus and he gets refocused on the Lord. He's no longer looking at the chaos around him. He's looking at the greatness of God. And there's an important lesson here, one that we easily forget. The problems we face may be very big, but God is a lot bigger than that. We belong to a God who is indescribably great. His greatness is unsearchable, the psalmist says. That means there's no limits to it. It doesn't matter what we run into. It doesn't matter what we come up against. God is a lot bigger than that. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were called before the Jewish authorities and were sternly told that preaching about Jesus was no longer allowed in Jerusalem. So the, the apostles called a prayer meeting. They, they didn't say, God, 
what are we going to do? We are no longer allowed to preach. No. <laughs> According to Acts 4, the prayer meeting went something like this. So when they heard, they raised their voices to God and said, Lord, you're the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by, by the mouth of David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? These believers understood who their God was. Lord, if you made the heavens and the earth, who do these gentlemen think they are anyway? And as they focused on the greatness of their God, their problems started to look very puny. Their problems shrank in size as they viewed them alongside the one who made the heavens and the earth. Isaiah spoke of the greatness of God like this, and he said, all nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him as less than nothing, and worthless. This is the God in whom we have placed our trust. The just shall live by faith in this God. He is not in heaven biting his nails. He's not scratching his head trying to figure out what to do. He's not trying to get a handle on things. I remember hearing of a prayer meeting where a young lady stood and said, I think we should pray for God. He seems to be having a lot of problems of late. <laughs> well, you know, the young lady knew very little about the God who reigns on high. I mean, he spins galaxies on his finger. His power goes beyond all limits. He raises up rulers, and when it's time to do so, he takes them down. He takes them out. He made the mighty king of Babylon eat grass for seven years. He calls the shots. And in God's good time, evil will be dealt with and it will be done away with. And what will flood the earth is not evil. It's the goodness. It's the knowledge of the glory of God. And now we come to Habakkuk's response. And it's remarkable. He's been wrestling with God and pouring out his frustrations to him. And he's been hearing from God. And he he got a vision of God. And it was powerful. It was, it was overwhelming. And as a result, Habakkuk has come to look at things in a new way. He becomes overwhelmed with the unspeakable greatness of God and it rearranged his theology and he now views things from a totally new perspective and he ends his book with an exquisite piece of poetry one writer said it's one of the most magnificent pieces of imaginary poetry in scripture or anywhere else and not only do we have beautiful poetry here we have a remarkable example of what it looks like for the just to live by faith. Chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills to the chief musician with stringed instruments. And Habakkuk spells out a worst-case scenario. Complete crop failure. No grapes, no olives, no grain, livestock wiped out, no sheep, no cattle. But the prophet was prepared to trust God in the midst of absolute ruin and famine. And Habakkuk does not state that he would endure, he would persevere in the hour of distress. No, he said he would rejoice and be joyful. Well, how does he manage that? No grapes, 
no olives, no grain, no sheep, no cattle. What does he have left? Well, there is something that the Babylonians can't take away from him. Notice in verse 18, I will be joyful in God, my Savior. A Savior is a good thing to have when you find yourself in a difficult place. A Savior is, out, is someone who is there to save, to deliver, to rescue, to make a way out. That's what saviors do. That's their job description. And actually, it's in the very meaning of the name Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. It's what he came to do. And Habakkuk is saying, I don't know how I'm going to manage when the Babylonians come over the walls, but I have a savior, a savior who is great and who is mighty, and he's going to be there for me. And he will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on high hills. It's likely that Habakkuk is thinking of some member of the mountain goats, the largest members of the deer family. And they have this incredible ability to scale steep mountains. Uh, they are swift and they are sure-footed. It's uncanny how they can balance on tiny outcroppings on rock-faced mountains in what looks like inaccessible places. We no doubt have all seen pictures of these amazing animals as they go up what looks like a sheer rock face and they, they find places to stand and they can keep their balance. To be like one of them would be most helpful when the land gets overrun by Babylonians. When the Babylonians are on your tail, it would be a great advantage to be able to run like a deer or climb like a mountain goat. There was a, a Vietnamese Christian <clears throat> named Hien Pam, who was arrested when his country fell to the communists. While in jail, he was bombarded with communist propaganda and the daily dose of Marx and Engels caused his faith to waver, and finally he decided he would no longer pray to God. The next morning, he was assigned to clean the latrines of the prison. And as he did so, as he cleaned out a container filled with toilet paper, his eye caught sight of a page out of a book. He washed it off and took it home to read. When his roommates had fallen asleep, he pulled out a flashlight and began to read. At the top corner, it said, Romans chapter 8. Quite taken aback, he read these words. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And Hien wept. God could not have given him a more relevant passage to a person whose faith was crumbling. And he cried out to God for forgiveness. The next day, he requested to clean the latrines again, and he continued this chore on a regular basis. Some official in the camp was using a Bible as toilet paper, and each day, Hien picked up a portion of scripture, cleaned it off, and used it for his nightly devotional reading. And through a set of providential circumstances, Hien was released, and he began to make plans to escape from the country. He built a boat in secret. Fifty-three other people planned to escape with him. All was going according to plan when four Viet Cong soldiers knocked on Hien's door. They had heard that he was trying to escape and wanted to know if it was true. He denied it and made up a story to explain his activities. The soldiers left. Hien was relieved, but disappoint, disappointed with himself, and 
he confessed to God that he had done wrong and said, Lord, if they come back, if they come back, I'll tell them the truth. A few hours before they were to set sail, the four men came back. We know you're trying to escape. Hien gave his answer, yes, I am, along with 53 others. Are you going to imprison me again? They leaned forward and whispered, no, we want to escape with you. The escape plan was carried out and all 58 found themselves on high seas in the middle of a violent storm. They survived the storm thanks to the good sailing abilities of the four Viet Cong men. And God had brought them on board for a good purpose. And Hien subsequently was able to arrive and make his home in the United States. Like a sure-footed mountain goat, he was able to escape and God intervened in a mar marvelous way on his behalf. Not too long ago, a brother by the name of Jonathan Evans gave a powerful eulogy at the funeral of his mother. Many had prayed for her and then the Lord took her home to heaven. And Jonathan wrestled with God over this and he shared at the funeral what he felt God had said to him. And this is what he shared. Just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean that I haven't answered your prayer anyway. There was always going to be only two answers to your prayers. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. Either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she, she was going to be with family or she was going to be with family. Either she was going to be well taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. The two answers to your prayer are yes and yes, because victory belongs to me, said the Lord. On one occasion, the prophet Elisha was in the city of Dotham, and the king of Syria sent his army to capture the prophet. In the morning, Elisha and his prophet, and sorry, his servant, woke to see the city surrounded by a Syrian soldiers and Elisha's servant was frightened and said what, what are we going to do Elisha's response was do not be afraid of them for those who are with us are more than those who are with them so the prophet prayed and said God I pray that the eyes of my servant will be opened that he may see and the man's eyes were opened and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha The just shall live by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's the ability to see the hidden world around us. Suppose God were to open our eyes and let us see the spiritual world around us. Suppose he let us see angels that have been sent to minister to us. Suppose he let us see his presence with us, his spirit, within us, we would be amazed. Our fears would vanish. I don't know how crazy things are going to get, but we know in whom we have believed. And our help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And I love those words of C.T. Studd when he said, I love to find myself in a tight corner to have the luxury of seeing how God will get me out of it. <laughs> That's a great statement. I love to see, to see myself in a tight corner to have the luxury of seeing how God will get me out of it. Well, Habakkuk started his book in a dark valley, but he ends up on a mountaintop. And his journey was not an easy one. But he ends up on a pinnacle of praise. He got a bigger picture of God. A God whose power makes every problem look very small. A God who is worthy of our unwavering trust. And the prophet's confusion was swallowed up by confidence. 
his fear turned to faith, his worry turned into worship, and Habakkuk was transformed from a burdened down prophet to a joy-filled man who sings God's praises. He started out in a dark place, but when he finishes, the light is shining. Now his circumstances had not changed. What was it that changed? His perspective had changed. He got his eyes back on the maker of heaven and earth. Someone said that the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prism, the prison of anxiety is optional. The presence of anxiety, yeah, that's unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety, that's optional. We can break out of that prison when we choose to rejoice in God in the midst of the storm. The just shall live by faith. They live with their faith firmly placed in God, a God who is bigger than any problem that may come our way. We can live without grapes or olives or grain or sheep or cattle, but we can't live without God. We can't do life without God. And I hope that all of us can affirm that. Without him, we're lost. <laughs> but we have him as our Lord and Savior. We've committed our life to him. And we rejoice in the fact that our lives are in his hands. Habakkuk did not have grapes or olives or grain or sheep or cattle, but he had God, the God of his salvation. He had God. And that made all the difference. May God bless his word to us today. Thank you.